Before we continue with the analysis, I want to talk to you guys about JerseyFIFA.com, the home of all of the greatest football kits. Whether that's the latest home shirts, the latest away shirts, tracksuits, or even retro kits, Jersey FIFA has a bit of everything. There really is something for everyone, so if you are interested, then make sure to use the link in the description down below and head to JerseyFIFA.com. Hey guys, welcome back to the AJ Analysis channel, where today we actually have a video on Manchester United winning a football match within 90 minutes. Haven't seen it for a couple of weeks. I thought it was a really good performance. An important 1-0 win. A really, really big three points in the race for the top four. And like I said, I think it was deserved. I thought United played well and were the better team. Tactically, I actually thought it was pretty straightforward. I think Unai Emery got it. Did he get it wrong? Maybe just a little bit wrong in places. I also thought that Ten Hag had a good plan. I thought um, some important players played really well and kind of improved their performance on recent weeks. So yeah, let's break down the tactics. And it's going to start with Manchester United playing out from the back, where, you know, this is where I feel like Unai Emery got it a little bit wrong, because he decided to kind of press in a 4-4-2 shape. Now, this wasn't always an intense press. Sometimes they would sit off and kind of retreat back into position. But there were situations on goal kicks where they did try and press a little bit higher. So obviously what United are going to do is kind of split the centre-backs and have the full-backs quite deep. Villa kind of went 4-4-2. Watkins on Lindelof, Buendia on Shaw, McGinn on Malasia, Ramsey on Dallo. But the, the problem they had was that their two midfielders, who would typically back up the press, were kind of being pinned by Sabitza and Eriksen, and they didn't trust having one of their centre-backs move into this position because they were so scared of Rashford. But this meant that Casemiro was often the free man. Now, obviously, he's not the free man literally from the goal kick because Villa are a bit narrower. But say when the ball went wide, particularly to Dallo, the fact that he is a player who kind of takes his time on the ball, gets his head up before playing a pass, meant that he was often able to squeeze this ball in here to Casemiro, and then United have kind of changed this into a transition, and now they're quickly attacking forward. So, yeah, it was a bit of a weird approach from Villa. I don't really know what Emery was expecting. It just didn't really work. Leaving Casemiro free in this area isn't a great idea, because he is someone that you can press. But if you don't, then he will kind of take control of the tempo of a game. And this is exactly what we saw from the back. I also think Dallow deserves credit for the way that he played these passes. He's one of the few in the squad which does kind of take his time on the ball, get his head up, like I said, set the ball for himself and then play the pass. And yeah, it worked for United and allowed them to get out from the back. With United able to get out from the back quite easily, the theme for the game was soon set. And it's all about how are Manchester United now going to try and dominate possession? What shape are they going to use? Well, they went for a back three nine times out of ten. With kind of Shaw playing in this area as a left centre-back. Lindelof here, we've got Dallo uh, completing the back three. And then, more often than not, Casemiro and Eriksen in a double pivot, with Tyrell Malasia pushing a bit further forward. So what we can see is we've got this back three here of Shaw, Lindelof and Dallo. We've then got a double pivot of Eriksen and Casemiro. And then Sancho, Malasia, Sabitza and Bruno Fernandes on the right wing, playing behind Marcus Rashford. And the idea behind this shape, basically, was to have Dallo here, Shaw here, in these wider areas where they can't really be pressed. McGinn doesn't want to come out and press because he's worried about leaving these spaces in behind him. And the same for Ramsey on the other side. It's also difficult for Watkins and Buendia because they're two versus three. What this meant was that Dallow and Shaw had a lot of time on the ball in these areas. However, it wasn't just these two that were taking up these positions because there were a lot of rotations. And I mean a lot of rotations. Very early on in the game, we saw that there were times when Eriksen was going to be in this area, where Tyrell Malasia might be in this area. We saw Casemiro dropping in between the centre-backs at times. There was so many different rotations in this area with the idea of just getting different players on the ball, basically. And it obviously makes it quite difficult for Villa to kind of press them and track them because they're all moving into different positions. But what it also does is it gives different United players the opportunity to try a long ball over the top. Because this really was the game plan. Villa are in a very high 4-4-2. But they're not really applying pressure to the ball. Like I said, Shaw has time in this area, Dallow has time in this area, or whoever else it might be dropping into these positions. So Villa kind of had this problem of... They're not really applying pressure to the ball, but they're also playing a super high line to try and kind of take out the threat of Marcus Rashford, try and catch him offside. And this basically, for certainly the first hour of the game, this was where the game was played. It was, can United time this ball over the top? Can they execute the pass? And can the player control the ball and get it in on goal? That was really the big question in this game. That was the big test. Now, to be fair to Villa... Um, Nine times out of ten in the first half, they did catch United offside and held the line well. But to me, it just seems like a really, really risky game to play. We've got uh, Sabitzer, who we know is happy to run from deep. Fernandez, who's happy to make this run from kind of out to in. Eriksen also making the run from deep. And of course, Marcos Rashford, who is these days 
really good at timing this run in behind the defence. It just felt that it's, I guess it's a high risk, high reward strategy from Aston Villa. Because, like I said already, there were a lot of times when they caught United offside. And if this game finishes nil-nil, you probably say they nailed it. The fact that they lose the game though, and did concede several chances from this, it just makes it a little bit questionable. And like I said, genuinely, this was the most important theme of the game. It was that long ball over the top. You know, if we're talking in terms of like sustained attacks in the final third, we didn't actually see that an awful lot. And that was because United were very clearly trying to play forward quickly. I think importantly though, Ericsson and Casemiro, Casemiro in particular, was much better than what he has been recently. Ericsson was also very, very good with his long passing. I believe they both attempted to over 10 long passes each. And again, that was the theme for the game. Can we time that ball? But I thought both of them performed much better than what they have done recently and were key to the win. Um, but yeah, kind of for me to do a video on this is actually pretty straightforward. Because this wasn't massively about creating overloads in the final third. It really was about can you time that ball over the top. So this is going to be a slightly shorter video. Now, I think the other thing which Villa didn't really nail as such was their defensive structure. What I was talking about in my tactical preview is... As always, the ability to overload the last line, for example, 5 versus 4 here. But the thing that I really pointed out was that Villa don't normally let that happen. Because they normally drop one winger, if not two, all the way back into the kind of back line to stop these overloads from happening. They just felt like they were a little bit slow to do that. There were times where we saw them in a back 5, yes, and they kind of matched up. But when that happens, United are happy to push the extra player forward. Now, like I said, again, typically, Villa take this as the, the message to drop the extra player in and make the back six. They didn't really do that. So something which happened, which I didn't expect in this game, was that United were able to overload the defence. However, the players just lacked the killer pass. I think they tried to be a bit too quick of it, you know. It seemed to be that once in the final third, United felt like the next pass had to be the killer pass. And, you know, that isn't the case. I think Eric Ten Hag is a manager, which very much wants you to kind of build down one side of the pitch. Look, can we create something? If we can't, let's go backwards, cycle possession out the other side, then look for a gap over here. Does it work? Come back, let's look for a gap over here. United didn't really do that. It seemed to be, as soon as you got into the final third, can we try a really difficult little clip, which, if it works, it looks phenomenal. But the chances of it coming off are quite low. So this is why we didn't see tons of chance creation in this game, simply because United were being a bit too quick in the final third. However... I mean, like they, they won the game, and they did deserve to win the game. They were a far more threatening team. I also think they defended pretty well as well. In terms of pressing, United kind of went back to their usual structure, which we've seen this season. At times it worked, at times it didn't. That structure is, of course, Eriksson and Sabitzer going man-for-man man in midfield here. We've got Rashford, who's going to split the centre-backs. And then we've got the wingers, who are going to kind of play in between the centre-back and the full-back. So Sancho is in this position here, and Bruno Fernandes is in this position here. Now, at times it worked, particularly in the first half, I thought Martinez in goal, his distribution was really very poor, and this meant that United could win the ball in dangerous areas. However, there was still the same problem with the system of when Martinez does complete the pass, you've taken three players out of the game because the press is disconnected. So I didn't really think, you know, it's it's the same problem with the pressing, uh, pressing structure. I've said it for a long time now, I'm not a big fan. But there are times when it worked, and it was the case in this game. All round, though, I think apart from that, United did defend very well. When Wendia was dropping short, Luke Shaw was following or uh, following him all the way. The main player that I was worried about was Ollie Watkins. Casemiro and Lindelof kind of done a good job of doubling up on him. And that was because Casemiro was essentially the free man of the pitch. With Dendonka and Luiz playing deeper in a double pivot, Sabitzer and Eriksen picked them up. Casemiro was spare to kind of win these balls or go out wide and win this ball over here. And like I said already... I think he had a much better game, not just on the ball like we were talking about earlier. Defensively, he was much more himself. He was getting about the pitch, winning his duels, putting his tackles in, winning his aerial duels as well. He didn't seem to have that recent hesitance almost of, am I going to get booked or suspended again? He didn't, he kind of seemed like a bit freer in this game almost. And it made United so much better defensively. Also the box defence from Lindelof when balls were coming into the box towards Watkins. Lindelof done brilliantly. And, you know, again, I'd done a video on it the other day. Really good performance from Lindelof. Really enjoyed what I saw. And yeah, in general, United, they did deserve to win this game. It wasn't the most exciting game. There wasn't tons of chances created. But United just all day long had that ball over the top which they could play. And kind of ironically, the goal actually comes from a Villa goal kick. Villa send it long for some reason. I'm not sure why. You know, we've just discussed, they played short from the goal kicks pretty much all day long. But on this one occasion, they decided to go long with the goal kick. The header gets punched forward. Rashford runs in behind. Uh, shot gets parried. Bruno Fernandes finishes it. 
So, it, it's, it's a bit of a weird one because the, the two things we've just spoken about, it didn't really come from that, although it, it kind of did because maybe, you know, United's press was decent, Villa felt threatened by it, so they felt the need to go long, and then they do get exposed for having the high line. It's a bit of a weird situation, and maybe a, a lesson on why you shouldn't always go long from goal kicks, and why it isn't actually safer than going short. But that's a conversation for a different day. In terms of this game, chance creation-wise, not massive. XG-wise, not massive. But United always felt in control, they looked a better team. Villa had little to no threat realistically, and I think Ten Hag would be really pleased with his performance, kind of. Uh, bouncing back from some recent difficulties, some recent setbacks. So yeah, United deserved the win. Let me know what you think in the comments down below, though. Who was your man of the match? For me, I'd be tempted by Lindelof. I thought he defended really well. I thought Eriksen was very good. Uh, Casemiro was good. But let me know what you think in the comments down below. Yeah, that's pretty much all for today. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you have enjoyed the video. And as always, I will see you in the next one.